Um, yeah, so this is my uh, workshop for people who are not really into networking, but you know would like to to understand how to make it easy and fun. So let's get started. So today I want to go over. Let me just givers and takers. I think this is the first step to understanding a little bit how to get and give what you need through networking. Um, I'm going to cover a few things around selling and how to brand yourself, how to sell uh, your brand, your name, uh, how to ask for favors, uh, professionally speaking, how to um, obtain those favors, like who are the people who will help you throughout your career. Um, and so we're gonna look at the give, give, give formula. And I think it's it's a good way to, to approach people uh, online. The three C strategy and how to use it. This is also something that I created and I think it has worked very well for my clients. Unmet needs and vulnerability and how you can sell through those. Home to approach and working the networking room. So we're gonna look at a map and, and get really practical about networking and, and what not to do in a networking event. So. Um, Give and take. Let's start with that. And I think this is a, is a you know, it's, it's good to have these concepts um, ingrained. So a lot of people um, are, are, you know, givers and in the workplace, you will see a lot of takers as well. Typically, you know, givers are the ones who are talking about us and we and the team. Uh, they typically put other people's needs before their own. They offer help but it's hard for them to accept help in return. Uh, they can ask for help in, on behalf of others, but it's hard for them to ask for help for themselves. And they feel easily indebted to other people. Like if they take help, they're gonna make sure that they repay that fast. The takers are more self-promoting. Typically they are using I and me and myself, a type of vocabulary. Uh, they're very self-protective, they're cautious in their approach, and they're zero-sum thinkers. They're very competitive in their uh, mind. It's it's I win, you lose. It's difficult for them to conceive a win-win situation. So these are just the general aspects, and I, and I don't want to vilify any of those two sides. You know, I, I just think it's important for us to be able to use um, you know, to either be a giver or a taker, depending on the situation at work, uh, especially so that you can benefit yourself. So uh, I want you to understand giving uh, value as, as a selling, you know, strategy. So selling to me, selling, selling yourself, selling your skills um, sh should be something you do through giving value to others. So, so this is the strategy, you know, there's a book called Give and Take written by uh, a guy called Adam Grant. And I highly recommend this book. It's it's really my Bible for networking. And he talks. So he goes to, to study a, a, a sales team and the sales team. Uh, he, he looks at the top performers and he looks at a bottom performers and, and what they have, you know, what's the, the difference. So he, he goes to discover that actually the top performers are givers, the middle range are all takers and the bottom performers are givers too so what's the difference between the top performers and 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 the ones who don't perform since they're both givers one is what he calls a giver ish and the other one is just you know a giver um a non-strategic giver so let's look at that more carefully so what's the giver ish mentality so he explains in the book, you know, the giver-ish people are the ones who give, but they know why they're giving, when they give, so they pack the giving. So they don't give their time every day. They try to pack the giving one day a week, I'm going to give, like every Friday or every Monday, I'm going to be, you know, helping others, revising other people's work or supporting or mentoring and coaching. All the other days are going to be for me. I'm going to invest in my career. And to whom you give is really important. And like if you just give without really being uh, uh, strategic about it, you're going to hurt yourself. So he, he, he explains that giving strategically your time and attention without any expectation is something very strategic in, in professional advancement. Being the first to give is, is quite powerful because um, 
when you do that, you, you create um, value for the other person that you are, you know, investing in. And typically what I do, if I want to approach somebody on LinkedIn that I admire, I'm going to read their articles. I'm going to make specific compliments about them, ask questions and listen to what they say um, and offer unsolicited help. So the unsolicited help, I think, is a really good uh, approach because, you know, there's the surprise element and, and people have this um you know when you help they kind of feel indebted to you so they're going to want to help you back so let's look a little bit at how you go about asking favors um so there are a few habits that i think are important to highlight givers they are very hesitant apologetic they beat around the bush they demonstrate desperation you know typically people who are unemployed it's really hard for them uh so they're going through a lot of insecurities and you know they're not necessarily confident when they're approaching people in that state uh, they demonstrate desperation and typically this is going to hurt their um, advancement now takers they don't add value before they take uh, they forget to give back when they receive and they they usually don't want to wait in line they, they they cut the line they refuse to wait and you know being a taker can work but um, the problem is you're going to have to be very uh, creative because if you only take and don't give back, then you're going to have to change uh, the target every time. So it's hard for you to build relationships that are lasting and that will actually benefit you in the long term. Maybe you benefit in the short term, but, but not in, in, in continuously. So here's one thing that um, it's also um, um, Adam Grant also talks about this, but there's another Adam who talks about this, Adam Rifkin. So he is, um, he considers himself to be a giver. He calls himself Panda. He is actually the most powerful networker on LinkedIn today. Uh, not because of the number of people he's connected with, it's about 80,000, but because of the quality, the people in his network are the most powerful people in the world today, mainly in the tech industry. So he um, he has sold a few companies. He's a very you know a successful entrepreneur and he runs a meetup group called 106 Miles and it's based in San Francisco. So anybody can go to this meetup group and meet him. Um, and I was lucky enough to go and meet him in this meetup group. And it was very interesting. You know, he greets everybody by shaking everyone's hand and he's asking, you know, what can I do for you? How can I help you? So he connects people through his network and he just gives a lot of value to people because, you know, he's a giver, right? So he, he went to discover, you know, who are the people who actually help us in our career? So there's a lot of theories about this, but so... There's the strong ties, which are people we know. There's the weak ties, people we don't know so well. And then there's the dor dormant ties, people we used to know, used to work with, but then we lost contact. So uh, actually what's really funny is that, you know, out of, if you want to rank them, so the one who are going to help you the most are the dormant ties, then the weak ties, and then the strong ties are the last one to help you progress in your career. And why is that? Because the strong ties, they have the same connections that you have. They know the same people that you know. So they don't have, there's no magic there because, it, you know, they, they don't know anyone outside the circle that you already belong to. Uh, now, the weak ties, they have more connections outside of your circles. And then the dormant ties are the ones who, you know, they trust you, they know the quality of your work, they used to work with you or study with you. Now you've, you've lost contact, you know, um, and, and they've created a new network, a new circle of, of friends, and um, they typically are the ones who will be able to help you the most. Now, the other thing that I've noticed, you know, when, when I am coaching people in general, I feel like there's a lot of sorry. Oh, sorry, I was on the phone. Sorry, I was at lunch. Sorry, I couldn't answer your email. Sorry for the delay in responding to your request. Sorry, because, you know, I'm busy. Well, 
all of these, sorry, um, they don't help people to take what's theirs. So what I recommend to my clients, I know this affects typically women more than men, I feel, but I, I, there's a lot of sorries in writing. So if you can avoid saying sorry when you're writing an email or a message, that would be really helpful. Uh, you know, you just, you, you can say, you know, I was really busy lately. I only got time to, to do my emails, you know, uh, tonight and, um, um, yeah, you, you you know, don't 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 feel apologetic. Don't don't act sorry because when you do that, it feels as if you're not you don't deserve the help that you're asking for. So that's going to be um, you know, it's not going to be in your favor. The other thing that I've realized is that um, you know people think about this in a linear way. This whole strategy, I give and I take, I give and I take, but it's not really linear. It's actually give give give. So then you can take 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 and really take everything on the table so when you invest up front when you so the, the way you would go about it is researching your targets you add value to them you engage them by asking smart questions you offer unsolicited help you set up a meeting ideally a video conference or you know or a meeting in person if you can you pay for the drinks you withdraw so that's another thing that i feel people don't know how to use so well uh, because they're either really anxious or even desperate sometimes to 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 get you know a, a response for 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 their interview or maybe you know they they are really um they have a certain urgency right so when when the other person feels that urgency it doesn't help when you give them a bit of a break when you disappear for two three weeks after approaching them um then it makes people feel wait a second um maybe that person um, you know has other prospects has other things that she's working on maybe they 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 are actually quite valuable because people who who you know who are kind of desperate for for their new job or um, they're really anxious to know how the interview went they, they are usually very frequently writing to, to recruiters and to hiring managers so when you're not that kind of when you don't transmit that kind of anxiety i think it helps you and then when you um come back later after kind of disappearing a little bit creating because you know uh, there's value in scarcity so people value what's not available all the time so when you come back after your withdrawal then you ask unapologetically for whatever it is that you want because you already invested up front and then your ask can be big enough you know you can ask for a referral you can ask for you know for them to introduce you to someone influential you can ask for a recommendation you can ask for whatever it is that, that you need study your target how do i study my targets i evaluate their handshake i evaluate their body you know language their posture i observe them if they're maintaining eye contact i think it's it's a plus i i look at whether people are touching their hair and their face because that demonstrates insecurity the neck uh that's the worst uh i look at the the, the how they dress even I mean the bold colors are usually the most impressive ones so avoiding black avoiding dark colors is, is always a good strategy red um, is, is is better uh, yellow pink all, all of these colors that you you already know so um, I, I look at whether or not they're displaying desperation too much excitement because that gives me a lot of clues I can I can start to guess uh, how you know how important this is for them. It's kind of a poker game, right? And I also um, I, I I also look at people who are giving too much explanation. You know, when as a recruiter, when I ask people, okay, so how much would you like to make? They tell me, for example, oh, uh, you know, right now I'm making 80k a year. Then I have a bonus, um, and so with the bonus I make about 90k. And so, um, you know, I have free lunch. So if you calculate everything, so I'm making about 100k right now. So when people do that, they give me so much information. They overshare so much, and I get a lot of insights when I. All I asked was, how much do you want to make? I, I didn't really ask anything else. So the right answer here would be, you know, I want to make 100K. 
or I want to make 110. Don't say, oh, I want to make between 100 and 110 because I'm obviously going to choose the lower end. You know, as an employer, I'm going to go for the 100K. You should say something that is more credible, like 106 or, you know, 107, because then it makes me wonder, okay, well, maybe that's exactly what he's making right now or just a little bit more. So, um, without oversharing, without justifying, without explaining why, just, just you know, be bold about this. Um, compel people to help you. That's a good strategy because I feel um, th this is a game of, you know, back and forth, back and forth kind of, you know, first you come forward, then you create some space. Um, you find a balance between too much space and too little space when you're interacting with people online and offline. Leaving on a high is something that I think is very important. What does that mean? When the conversation is really good, when you feel like you connected with the person, when you want it to keep going on for hours, that's when you should leave. You should never take more than 45 minutes of anyone that you met, you know, for the first time. Because when you leave on a high, you will, you will have a guarantee to meet again. When you let the conversation drop to a point of, oh, you know, people start looking at their watches and they start feeling anxious to leave, you can be sure that you will not have another chance to meet that person. So leaving on a high is really important, professionally and personally as well. I think that works very well. You must remember that too much presence, too much availability, too much circulation makes the price go down. People want scarcity. People want to chase, you know, and typically, you know, as a recruiter, what I see is the following. People who apply for the jobs that I post, I value them, of course, but I value more the people that I chase, the people that I find and that I chase that I want to place in that role. Don't overshare. So I talked about this. Keep the mystery going. Only answer what is asked. So if I'm asking you how much do you want to make, you just tell me how much you want to make. You don't tell me how much you're making currently. Don't justify yourself because that conveys a lot of insecurity. Don't reveal everything. You know, don't play your hands too soon. For example, oh, I would love to work for you, but I need to leave work at 4.30 because I need to pick up my kids or I need to work from home on Fridays or, um, you know, I, I, whatever it is that your situation is, keep that for a later, you know, conversation for, an, uh, for you know, you, you, you won't start talking about these details after the third meeting with the hiring manager or the recruiter. You, you can't reveal all of that so soon let people first feel that they like you that they want to engage in this relationship with you that they want to grow um you know and 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 in this um because it's i compare this a lot to the dating uh industry there's a lot of uh, similarities between you know finding the job that you want and finding you know the man or the woman that you want because the thing is would you go on a date, like a first date, and would you tell people something like, uh, you know, I need to tell you right away, I snore. You know, nobody does that. People will eventually discover you. And once they are interested and attracted to you, then, you know, they'll accept whatever it is that you do or don't do. So try to keep, um, don't, don't overshare, right? So let people discover you gradually. Um, now we're going to talk about the three C's, and I think this is a really great formula. It's basically complement, commonalities, contributions. Um, so what, what, how do you use them and, and how they can benefit you? Complements. So whenever you approach someone online that you want to connect with, first thing you're going to do, you don't know them, you want to connect first. You add a note, you just say, wow, what a great profile, what are them? impressive background, what a beautiful career that you've built. Uh, you know, you just come in with compliments. They, they got to be authentic. They got to be um, specific. But I mean, if they're not specific, at least make them authentic and big. Honor people's career before you take anything from them. So um, and, and flattery only works when you ask a question after, you know. So for example, wow, what a beautiful 
uh, trajectory, what a great background you've built for yourself. Can we please connect? I would love to be a part of your network. Typically, people say yes to that kind of approach. The second thing you want to do right after that is establish three common points between you and that person. Why three? Three is the ideal number. Less than three doesn't work. More than three works, but you don't need to do that, right? Three is enough for people to trust you. There's a lot of research that has been done around this. And there's a book called Captivate written by Vanessa Van Edwards. I really, I really like what she has done. She's a behavioral um, you know, um, specialist. So she studies uh, people's behavior for a living. And uh, so, so once you have established, she also discovered that once you have established three common points with any given person, people tend to trust you. But it has to be specific. You can't just say, hey, we're both from Spain, right? That's a bit too it has to be more specific. You, you were both, you know, we both went to the same school or we both went, you know, and worked in the same company or we were born on the same, you know, day. It has to be somewhat specific for people to feel like, oh, okay, you, you are someone I can trust, right? And the third thing that you want to do right after that is offer something to that person. So, you have to make a contribution and then right after you're going to ask for their contribution. So the contribution would, could be anything. Hey, uh, I thought you might be interested in this article, this conference, this webinar, this event, uh, this ebook, um, you know, this podcast. Um, here's, you know, I don't know, uh, a discount code for this seminar that I'm going to. Maybe it could be interesting for you. Whatever it is, it has to be in line, of course, with their line of work. So offer unsolicited uh, sort of contribution uh, to, to them. And then right after, you can ask for something from them. By the way, you know, um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, everything doesn't have to happen in one hour, right? It can be several messages spread out throughout several days. It doesn't, you know, there's no, um, there's no uh, rule for that. So the contribution that you're going to ask can be anything, you know, I... Um, I've, you know, I've been, I've been looking at what you've, what you've promoted, what you've published, what you've, um, and I, and I'm super interested in, in, you know, whatever it is, artificial intelligence. Do you think we could sit together uh, and, and grab coffee whenever it works for you? I think that the most important thing that you can get from anyone is to make the conversation that is happening online to make it happen offline. That's what you want to get, really more than anything else and you want to do that as fast as possible so what i would do after i contributed all of this i would try to make sure we meet and if we don't live in the same place i would make you know this uh, uh a, a call right uh, like a skype call so that you can get um to, to 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 be in front of that person and then you can just basically ask them questions once you are in front of them all you want to do is collect data so that you can use that um, so, you know, where do you work? Do you like your job? What are your challenges? Is the company growing? Is the company downsizing? So you want to collect data because you want to use that, you know, so two weeks down the line after you had a coffee with them, after you paid for the coffee and you only took 45 minutes of their time, you can ask them, hey, um, I had a great chat with you. By the way, I just applied for a job where you're working right now and I wonder if you could give me a referral. So that's a lot easier for people to swallow. And that, that is typically how it works. Uh, friendking. So this is a concept that I came up with because people keep asking me, okay, Rebecca, so there is no such thing as a friend or and a networking connection. Like, what's the difference? Like, how do you see this? And I've thought a lot about this. And quite frankly, I don't think there is a difference, you know? people who you can support in their career can also support you back and they don't necessarily have to be your friend but we're not we're not necessarily it's an exchange of favor here so um don't take things i think too personally and establish the fact that there is no balance i feel it's an integration just like work-life balance is something that's just not 
it doesn't really exist. It's work-life integration, just like friends and connections can easily sort of serve you uh, well if you if you do this uh, in a smart way. So when you've taken the time to invest in people, genuinely invest in people and that you care about them, uh, you actually have an unfair advantage in business. You have friends. And I think that's that's a, it's a good um, way to describe it. Um, and, and, and I've seen this working really well. Now that you know how to invest, let's cash out. Selling. Selling is nothing more than leading you to my conclusions, but on your terms. So let me explain this to you. So a salesman is going to call you and is going to try to sell you something. And they're going to be really pushy. They're going to be probably it's going to be expensive. Maybe the product is not going to be delivered at the right time. So you, your, your, your response is going to be, hey, sorry, this is too expensive and it's not going to be delivered, you know, when, when I want it to be delivered. Therefore, I'm not interested. So typically what they're going to do is say, okay, so you're telling me that if I present you something that has a better price and if I'm able to ship it to you by tomorrow, are you telling me that you would say yes to that? And then you're like, yeah, exactly, right? I would say yes to that, but you're not going to do that. So they hang up, they call you back, they call you back and they say, hey, based on what you told me, here is the product at a lower price and I can deliver it to you, um, you know, by tomorrow. So based on what you said to me, and we all want to be consistent, you said you would agree to this sale. So, so, you know, I'm sending you the papers, just sign it on the dotted line. Typically when, when this happens, people say yes. And, and, and this, this is how salespeople close their deals, right? They use what you said against you. They bring you to their conclusions, but on your terms. Um, I, I want you to understand that because we want to be consistent with what we say, sometimes we fall in this trap. And, and it's important to understand this because we can use it in our favor like if we're trying to sell us our skills. So when it comes to selling, what's really important is to use powerless communication marked by questions. So like I said, when you finally meet your target, what you do, you sit with them, you ask a lot of questions. So how is work? How is family? What are your challenges? Are you growing? Are you downsizing? Are you happy? Are you not? Just, you know, you just want to collect data because then you're able to use that against them. Um, you will you will understand how to um, somehow I would say make people come to your conclusion by using you know what they told you self persuasion we call it uh, tapping into unmet needs is also something very powerful so when when do you sell when are you able to close a sale it's when you're when you're right there at the right time in the right place. So what do I mean by that? So there, there's a famous story called, um, there's, there's a famous, um, when you look at Casanova, he was a very famous, you know, womanizer. He was able to get what he wanted from every woman, right? So people, you know, went and studied him. He was also very successful, a uh, very successful businessman. Um, one day he walked into a cafe, he saw a really beautiful lady and he was trying to convince her, you know, to, to, to go with him and, and hang out with him, but he was not successful. And so he went back home. This lady was actually uh, an actress, um, and, but she had um, a speech um, sort of issue. Like she couldn't say the letter R. Some people have this speech impediment she was one of them. So she, he went back home and he decided to write a whole play for her. But in the play, he, the, the whole play did not have the letter R in the play, right? So he goes back to the cafe, presents his play to her. And of course, she falls in love because he 
was able to meet an unmet need of hers, right? No one else would have gone through so much pain to convince her. And because of that, he was able to, you know, get anything he wanted from, from everyone really, because he was able to understand, okay, what is this person in need of? How could I make myself irresistible to them? There's another interesting experiment that was done uh, by a guy named Raj Perso. He's a psychologist from London and he went with his students and he decided to run an experiment to understand what makes people attractive. So they organized dates with people um, and he said to his students, okay, on this date, you're going to agree with everything the other person is saying. You're going to say yes to everything, right? The wine is great. Yes, you're right. Oh my God, the food is amazing. Yes, fantastic. Oh, this is a great, you know, restaurant, whatever. You're going to agree and say yes throughout the whole evening. So after that, they came back, they spoke to the participants and nobody was in love. Nobody was attracted. Okay, fine. So they tried another strategy. They went and they said no to everything that was said to them. Okay, this is a great wine. No, it's not. I don't like it. Okay, this is a great meat. No, I don't like it. Throughout the whole evening, the person was there disagreeing with the other person the whole evening. And so what happened, that was also not attractive, right? Nobody fell in love with that. And then the third experiment was basically, okay, half of the evening, the first half of the evening, you will disagree with everything. The second half of the evening, you will agree with everything. And what happened there? They felt extremely attracted to that person. Why? Because we want to have an impact on others. What do I mean by that? The first part of the evening you were negative and then all of a sudden you became positive and it was because of me that's what we think right we assume that somehow i shifted your perception and that's very attractive we want to have an impact on other people's life if you can make other people feel this way you will become very attractive to them right vulnerability can I trust you? So the three things that people are asking themselves when they meet you for the first time is, can I trust you? Can I respect you? And do I like you? That's it. If they can answer this as fast and as accurately as possible, you're in. You can finally have you know, a conversation that is deep and meaningful when you have all these three things figured out and dealt with. So trust is the first thing that people are asking themselves out of these three questions how do you build trust fast and efficiently by showing vulnerability not too much though because you don't want to be perceived as someone weak you want to be perceived that as someone resilient so you can talk about your um i don't know your lack of whatever it is, right? Uh, if you go to a dance class, for example, you can show vul vulnerability because, hey, you know what? I'm not a good dancer, but I'm here and I'm trying and I'm not going to give up. I'm going to stay until the end of the class. When you present yourself like that, people um, are drawn towards you. They're drawn towards that. You know, first you show vulnerability, then you quickly show them how you're going to, you know, get up and be resilient and 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 you know build build something out of that can i respect you that's the other thing that i was just explaining now can you bounce back after the failure so the the first vulnerability is you know inform them about your failure the second thing about vulnerability is show them that you bounced back from that failure so don't try and in any interview, don't try to be the guy or, or the girl who is completely outstanding and perfect and who never failed. Don't say that, you, you know, you don't have weaknesses. Be yourself, but make sure to demonstrate that despite your weaknesses, 
you found ways and mechanism to cope and and build you know a brilliant career and and your resilience has has shown you you know so so show people that you're resilient essentially you have weaknesses but you're also able to bounce back from that so that's how you demonstrate um how you get people to trust you and respect you fast and efficiently in any conversation so now who do we approach that's a question that a lot of people ask me okay now i know how to do this but how and who where do i go right the future you so the future you you're going to go on linkedin tonight you're going to play around you're going to look at people who have a profile that you admire and people that you want to become one day people that you aspire to become you look at those people these are the people that you want to approach so you want to connect with the right target um and i think don't wait too long until you offer them a um, call to action. So what I what I mean by that, don't wait too much for um, the invitation to to basically you know offer them a coffee. That's what you want as fast as possible to meet them in person or on a Skype call. As soon as you've found your target, use the three C's formula and take the conversation offline as fast as possible. Working the networking room. So what do you do? Where do you stand? How do you work this out? The networking room is this, right? Typically you have a place where the drinks are, a place where the bathroom is, the food. Sometimes the food and the drinks are in the same area. You have the entrance, you have the coats, you know, where you, where you drop your coats. This is kind of a typical, you know, networking event. You walk in and you look at the host. Typically, the sweet spot is going to be around the host. You don't want to be at a networking event with your friends because you're going to hang out with your friends and you're not going to meet new people. You don't want to be talking to people at the entrance because people who walk into the networking room they're not ready to network right away what do they want to do they want to drop their coat they want to grab a drink they want to just you know understand the ecosystem first they're not ready to talk with you you're not going to have you know a very good conversation at the entrance you're not going to have a good conversation at the coats um the clock room you're not going to make great connections around the toilet area because people are coming and going that's not a place to stand and hope for a good conversation to happen you know where things happen it's it's very simple it's after people have dropped their coats have been to the bathroom have gotten their food have gotten their drink when they're standing in the middle where you see those little stars, the red, the yellow, and the orange. This, when they're standing right there with a fresh drink in their hands, that's when you attack them. That's when they're feeling ready to talk. And actually, if you don't have anyone to talk to at that moment, you feel a bit embarrassed, right? That's when you're actually ready to make a good connection, to have a good conversation that's when you approach people and like i said in the beginning the host around the host whoever is the host anywhere around the host is also a really good place to be because the host is going to know everyone and they are able to connect you with whoever you think makes you know will will be will be good for you so um so yeah so this is kind of how you um, you you see the cold zones are around the bathroom and the entrance. The hot zones are usually right after the bar and next to the host. What do you not want to do in a networking event? What I don't recommend is don't ever say you're unemployed. You can say you're a freelancer, you're a consultant, you're a student. Don't ever say, oh, I'm unemployed because that just you know turns people off immediately, right? 
don't say you are unsure about why you came. I was talking to a, a client the other day and she was invited to a networking event, but it was not really her crowd. It was a group of alumni from a university that she had not been to, but she was invited by one of them. So she was kind of like, oh, I should let people know right off uh, the bat that I don't belong here, you know, just to make it clear for everyone. And I was like, why would you want to make clear that you don't belong somewhere right away just to make people feel disengaged and uninterested in talking with you? Because, you know, if you show up and you say, hey, I actually don't belong here, it's basically you're, you're telling people don't don't connect with me because I cannot add any value. Otherwise, you know, it's just the worst thing you can do, right? Don't be the one answering the questions. Be the one who asks the questions because in any given conversation, the person who is asking the questions is the person controlling the flow of the conversation. Remember that. If you wanna be in control of any conversation, be the one asking the questions and stay in the, in the um, don't go into specifics, stay in the abstract, right? Because if I talk about traveling uh, to Asia for yoga and eating healthy, this is great. Nobody's ever going to, you know, take that um, away from you. Nobody's going to corner you in such a conversation. Now, if you say, oh, I love going to Thailand because when, whenever I go to Thailand, uh, I go and I stay in Bangkok. Um, and, and when I go to Bangkok, there's a really good restaurant that sells papaya salad, really cheap, but it's so fresh and it's delicious. Anyone can walk into that conversation and say, wow that's great what's the name of the restaurant and if you don't know the name of the restaurant that's it you lost control of the conversation right if you don't want to lose control of the conversation stay abstract be the person asking the questions not the one answering the questions if you go to any networking event and you feel like you're the one talking you're doing it wrong don't drink too much or eat too much. I think that's important. Don't be in a rush to leave because typically it's at the end of the meeting that things actually happen. Don't come with a friend because then you're going to be with your friend. You're not going to meet any people. Uh, and don't, don't dress in black. Ideally red. You know, I always go with a red jacket uh, to networking events because I'm the red dot in the middle of the black suits. And People won't remember your name, but they'll remember, oh, it's the girl in, in, in the red jacket or in the yellow jacket like I, I was wearing last time when, when I presented to you guys in Madrid. Be memorable. Don't be, you know, someone else in, you know, another person in black, right? Uh, be memorable. And remember, I think, to, to stand out at any networking event, it's only going to work at your favor. So thank you guys. I think that's it for today. If you have any questions, I'm here and I'm happy to answer them. Um, so yeah, that's it.